Okay, so let's uh, continue. And uh, we have a second lecture on conformal high spin geometry and high spin, conformal high spin series and holography by Dennis Schwarzov. Okay, main thanks. So uh, the plan for today is that we do brief recap and add some features that we had no time to discuss yesterday. Then I'll say, well, I'll spend a considerable amount of time talking about 4D uh, conformal higher spin gravities because you know, this idea of what conformal higher spin geometry is, uh, well, it was not it was not just for fun done by Segal. It, it was uh, along the course of looking for uh, concrete theories that realize uh, this symmetry. So then I say few, just very few words about three-dimensional case because there will be talk by Eva Lovrikovic today in the evening. So I'll, I'll say something that she won't probably have in her talk. And then I end up with bits of holography and maybe some concluding remarks like open questions or, uh, well, fr from this point of view. So, uh, uh, since on conformal geometry there are many textbooks, uh, but there is none on uh, conformal higher spin geometry. So, so basically the definition I'm using is this one, uh, that uh, by conformal higher spin geometry I mean certain theory of background fields or offshell gauge theory that extends, that extends this uh, offshell gauge theory or theory of a background field which is only metric here and has two types of gauge symmetries which are diffeomorphisms and uh, while rescalings. And uh, uh, as I tried to argue last time, uh, these structures, they, well, they form some discrete family, infinite family that uh, you can characterize by choosing matter for which you actually want to study your background fields and choosing some uh, back, uh, vacuum uh, to be precise conformally, conformally invariant uh, equation which would uh, determine the spectrum of all these operators and so on. So let me just repeat uh, the main logic. So uh, in the talk yesterday, we chose a uh, scalar field, the simplest, the simplest matter you can imagine. Also, we chose the simplest uh, conformal invariant equation where here I mean just in flat space, so global conformal symmetry. So I, as easy as it as is. So we chose this equation. Then uh, you can... Uh, a look at the spectrum of various operators in this conformal field theory, and you'll find many bilinear operators that uh, are conserved tensors. Plus dot dot dot. By the way, I think uh, it's right moment to start abbreviating uh, uh, certain things, and uh, in higher spin business, we usually uh, abbreviate a group of indices in which something is symmetric or you want it to be symmetric to symmetrize just uh, we call all indices to be symmetrized by one letter and with the APN group you just indicate the number of indices in the bracket this saves a lot of time like uh, maybe 20 years of uh, yeah, in total for the community if you use this notation uh, okay good so these are initial data this I can canonically associate to this initial data. Now that I have plenty of uh, conserved tensors on shell, uh, what I suggested to do following Segal, and I, uh, well, I recommend uh, his paper from uh, 2002. Uh, so what I suggested following Segal is to look at how these guys can couple to sources. And uh, because they are conserved on shell, and traceless, which can be achieved even off shell, there are two types of gauge symmetries that uh, naturally come here. So one sort of generalizes diffeomorphisms, another one uh, generalizes uh, wild symmetries to the higher spin case. So then uh, you need to find nonlinear completion of that story. And I gave you. Uh, some examples of which maybe the most non-trivial one was to couple stress tensor to metric, for which we know the solution to be a uh, conformal Laplacian, but if you go back to your source uh, and expand all this metric, inverse metric in the source, you find infinitely many terms. So a priori it's not clear how to find uh, such an unlinear completion. Uh, okay, but in this case, everything turns out to be very simple, just by some integration by parts. Segal suggested that the entire action where 
uh, this theory couples to all the sources can be written in this form, where here I have uh, generic generic differential operator, and okay, I'm using this notation here, uh, um, which uh, assumed to be expandable in P because P is what counts indices here, what counts this P. And there are uh, very simple uh, gauge symmetries that uh, you can easily see this action to be invariant over is uh, you take generic again uh, differential operator let me use p hat here because it's an operator you act on phi as, as a module so act with differential operator on a field uh, and uh, then maybe i made the mistake of passing to the star product language but not fully because um, I said that the solution can be explained to anyone who learned quantum mechanics, so they know uh, what X and uh, P are. But in practice, a convenient language to work with is Moyle Wild Star product. And then in one language, if you don't know what while, uh, Moyle Wild Star product is or just don't want to use it, you think about differential operators that say act on scalar, you can work it out. Or uh, say if you pass to symbols and now there is no hat here so it's a symbol of the corresponding operator you have to compute a star product and here set p to zero because you are not i mean you're not treating phi as another differential operator who just by chance doesn't have any derivative so you want the action and then uh, there is a symmetry that acts on h which is u dagger x p hat uh, h plus h u where uh, this thing is just multiplication of two differential operators. And uh, again, if you, if you like star product, then it's going to be, oops, uh, you complex conjugate because uh, in terms of Moyle while star product, Hermitian conjugation uh, means just complex conjugation at the level of symbols. Uh, so you have star product with H plus H star product U. Okay, uh, so you can easily see this action to be invariant and all the symmetries. And uh, why I'm saying this is a proper generalization of uh, this uh, theory of background fields or offshore gauge theory to higher spins is because, uh, first of all, this thing is contained in here. Why? Uh, because I can just tailor expand H, there is some scalar field, then I skip spin one, not interested today. Uh, then there is th this guy that transforms properly as a metric should under the corresponding gauge symmetries. Because again, if I expand gauge symmetries, somewhere here, there are usual diffeomorphisms represented by vector fields and uh, usual wire scaling. So you can easily see that in this subsector, I have exactly this formula and you have something for higher spins. Okay, that was the simplest scenario. So now, what are the knobs that you can tune here to get more of, uh, of such things? So the first knob is uh, you can play with different uh, conformally invariant operators. So I just took the simplest one. Instead, we can start with uh, box to power k phi equals zero. It's conformally invariant, very nice. Uh, but it changes story a lot because now if you work out the spectrum of higher spin currents, you find the different spectrum. There will still be some tensors that are just conserved, but on top of that, you'll find tensors that are partially conserved or a little bit conserved. So you have, say, T derivatives here, uh, divergence of um, order N, M S minus T indices left equal to zero. So there are still, uh, there are still currents you can associate with these guys, so there is some symmetry, just the usual neutral symmetry, but the spectrum is different. So I didn't, I hasn't, well, uh, I didn't change matter. I only changed the, the, the vacuum, so to say, the, the conformal invariant e equation. This changes the spectrum of currents. Correspondingly, it changes, it changes uh, the spectrum of sources. There will be other sources which, well, you can easily see that if you have that many divergences here that vanish, then at the level of gauge transformations, you have more derivatives uh, and less indices on your uh, gauge parameter. 
So you have completely different fields uh, here. Uh, and well, you can still run the same argument I did here. So you actually arrive at the same formulas. So this is your action. These are your gauge symmetries. But now what's important is that you, you pick a different vacuum for H. And it's important. So actually yesterday Harrod made a comment that maybe you should think about this as a matrix type model and I will do at some moment. But uh, it's important to make a uh, difference uh, between matrices and uh, operators here because if you pretend everything to be matrices, you can jump from one vacuum to another. That's not allowed in field theory. So this is essentially a different vacuum. vacuum. How do I see that? It's because it has completely different spectrum of operators, completely different sources, and so on. And I get another conformal higher spin geometry out of that in the sense that metric is still there, but uh, this dot, dot, dot will have different spectrum fields. And just, by the way, to make some references, so Xavier and Maxim, well, okay, Grigoriev Eckert, studied this uh, thing a lot. And on the mathematical side, there was a paper by Gover and uh, Silan, who studied higher symmetries of uh, this equation, which was generalization of earlier paper by Eastwood. So you can extract all the symmetries, I mean, the way I did last time. Okay, good. So here's this knob that you can tune a little bit. Now, what about this one? This one you can also play with because you're not obliged to I mean, work with uh, scalar fields till the end of your life. So you can play with fermions, just, just an, as, as an example. So we did this carefully with Maxim, and uh, I don't want to explain my own paper, so I'm just uh, basically giving the solution. So if you pick fermion, then the solution is very similar, uh, but in addition to having uh, differential operators, you have also Clif well, Clifford algebra here, factor of the Clifford algebra, and there are slightly different gauge symmetries that keep this action invariant, different spectrum of operators, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's why I'm saying that if you want a higher spin extension of this formula, you have that many. So you can, in principle, pick uh, infinitely many of different matter, and for each of them, there are infinitely many of conformal invariant equations that, uh, that you can work with. Okay, good. So if we're happy with this definition, then I can try to construct theories that uh, have these fields. And note that uh, in all of these examples, you always have infinite dimensional spectrum of higher spin fields, and there is no way to truncate it. But uh, sometimes, just for fun, you can, for example, pick uh, specific values for these higher spin fields. Say you can assume that some spin 2k uh, gets factorized in terms of metric. And then, uh, I discussed it a little bit, you can get uh, some kind of GGMS operators for free, but in a different language. OK, so now let's construct four-dimensional uh, informal higher spin theory. And uh, there are essentially two constructions, uh, the one by Segal and another one by Zeitlin. So I'll, I'll explain both of them, but uh, starting from this moment, I will have to skip uh, many things because I, I just give an idea. There are lots of computations behind. Uh, so, I, I, so these things I sort of derived last time. Now I can give all of the details. But uh, so let, let us first uh, have a look at what we want to get. Because uh, if we have just spin two, then uh, there is one uh, in four dimensions. There is one action that is conformally invariant. So it, it's a square of the wild tensor. And essentially what we want to find is uh, are these dot, dot, dots that have uh, higher spin fields on them. And uh, in field theory, people usually start with free fields on some simple background like flat space or the sitter, entity sitter, and try to construct interactions perturbatively. You can hardly do this in this situation, but uh, at least uh, 
having free fields is useful. So, and that was done long before. Uh, so Fratkin and Zaitlin, um, something like 82, say uh, they noticed that uh, given this uh, type of sources that I introduced with the symmetries they have, one can write down conformal invariant action in flat space now that have, well, certain projector here that depends on derivatives. And this uh, operator starts as box to power S and uh, plenty of Kronecker deltas plus et cetera that makes this action a uh, gauge invariant at least. And then you can check that uh, it, it is also conformal invariant. Or if you, if you pass to equations of motion, then they observe that there are some uh, conformal invariant operators that starts like these. And of course, this is a linearization of generalization of the Bach equation, because for spin two, this is just linearized Bach equation. Uh, but it would be nice to have something like this on, on gen general background and so on. And so this is what uh, we're gonna do uh, following uh, two approaches. They're rather different, um, but eventually they're all the same. And uh, the, well, talking about open problems. So what people tried in the recent years is to uplift this, well, uh, forgetting about complete theory, what you can try to do is to uplift this, uh, this operator to something that uh, leaves on general gravitational background. And there are many nice results here. For example, if you're on conformally flat background, uh, you can prove that this operator can be factorized pretty much like GGMS can. Uh, that was Mitsaev, uh, also Zaitlin, Maxim, and uh, well, Alexander, who I didn't see, probably he's in the economy class. <laughs> well, but I mean, there are two, two rooms. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, yes, but, but it, it's still not quite clear if you can make it work on general background or even on just Bach flat. So there are many open uh, issues here. Just talking about uh, this uh, higher spin generalization of uh, GGMS operator. Jenny, Jenny, sorry. Yes. It's, it's a bit quick. How to show? How do you show a conformal invariance of the action? Well, I don't, but uh, they did. But well, okay. In fact, but, but, uh, but they didn't. They didn't. In the paper, there is no proof that that it's conf it, it is conformal invariant. I think they explicitly say it in the review. But but okay. Uh, it, uh, so if we don't discuss well, who did first uh, where, uh, I'll I'll give the uh, well the construction of the entire action for which immediately follows that it's conformally invariant on flat background following this old folklore that once you have something diffeomorphism and while invariant, you put it on flat space, it's conformally invariant. Since we will have full action anyway, uh, well, uh, well, it will have to be conformally invariant. But, but since, uh, since, this is, since, since this is lecture or just, uh, and you said that it's easy, how do you show that it's easy to show? I said it's easy? Yeah. Well, well, okay. it, well, you can show conformal invariance. No, you, yeah, okay. you can, I, I, but... Yes, I, I really don't want to do this now, but what I would do instead of this language, I would pass to the language that was uh, used by Fratkin Linetsky, which is much more handy in terms of uh, uh, spinners. And there you introduce wild tensor, well, higher spin generalization of wild tensor. And uh, well, uh, the, there, there are some uh, constructions by Penrose, et cetera, from which you can easily see that uh, once you write it in spinorial indices, it's conformally invariant. But uh, I don't want to do this right now because we'll have full action, uh, which will be wild, diffeomorphism, and even higher spin invariant. So, uh, can, can I? Uh, yes. So, <clears throat> okay. So, 
let's try to construct the action following first segal. And now I will come uh, to this matrix uh, intuition that, uh, uh, well, Harold uh, made comment about. So let's pretend that in this uh, gauge transformation, everything are matrices. Why not? Okay, so since U is a general operator, neither Hermitian nor anti-Hermitian, I can decompose it into two bits. So if I uh, decompose it in, into this part and exponentiate it, what I get is uh, just unitary transformation. With the help of unitary transformation, I can try to diagonalize this H and just as a matrix, look like this. So it's diagonal and made out of eigenvalues it has. Now, uh, I can exponentiate this thing and, well, let's call it B, and uh, the finite transformation that I will have will, will look like this, where, where B is just a Hermitian matrix. Uh, it's not unitary, it's just Hermitian. So what this transformation does, this transformation sends, well, multiplies all, uh, all eigenvalues by uh, some factor, positive factor. So apparently uh, with the help of these transformations, you can diagonalize Hamiltonian and also you can uh, rescale all eigenvalues by something uh, positive, which means that eventually your, uh, your eigenvalues can be made belong to just uh, three, uh, three, well, set with three elements, plus, minus one or zero. Okay, now uh, what we want to do, we want to construct an action. So we want some function, will eventually be functional of H that is invariant and all of this. Well, uh, the only thing we can see invariant and all of these are the following three numbers n plus minus one or zero, which are number of uh, corresponding eigenvalues. Okay, uh, now let's slightly go back to the field theory. So our Hamiltonian starts like this, and then uh, there are these higher spin corrections, x and p that uh, we pretend to be small because uh, obviously, uh, while well, graviton is the, the main player, it determines geometry on which you put all the other fields. Maybe you can try to do something else, but uh, uh, thinking about field theory, this is the main guy, and these are small fluctuations. So, well, uh, this guy has non-negative non spectrum. Maybe I can shift it a little bit so that it's completely positive. I ignore zero modes. So if I'm not very far, perhaps there are no negative modes. And yes, Uh, meaningless? Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. so spin, spin two is dominant. Uh, this, uh, this part contains all higher spin fields. It, which, which I want, no, 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 all of them are here. Yes, but we will see the action actually looks very nice. So I can, I can decompose it into various pieces. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, spin, well, uh, uh, since conformal geometry is a part of uh, conformal higher spin geometry, uh, spin two, you can always remove all higher spin fields and just uh, have spin two. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to uh, well, find higher spin generalization of that. Okay, so, well, it's not very rigorous argument, but perhaps I can define this section to be just uh, the number of uh, positive eigenvalues because I don't see any negative, zero modes. Well, maybe there are no zero modes or at least I can regularize it a little bit by shifting so that there are no zero modes. So maybe this would work. Mm, doesn't look nice. Um, so actually the suggestion by Segal was to take these and write it coming to the uh, language of operators and star product as a trace of theta uh, of step function of H, because if you have some function 
of x uh, and you want it to be a function of operator and trace it, then uh, effectively what you have is a sum of eigenvalues of whatever function uh, you choose here. So this is so this is the same thing. So it, it just counts the number of uh, positive uh, eigenvalues here. And then you can ask, well, is it a well-defined object to work with? So uh, I will skip many details, but I'll, I would like to give an idea that you can actually expand this thing in H and compute turns. In fact, Segal extracted free action of Ratkin and Zaitlin, and he also wrote down some cubic terms. Uh, so, yeah. But uh, let me remind you again that it, it's quite dangerous to use matrix analogy because I already said that different vacuum are not equivalent. You, you simply have different uh, spectrum of operators. So it's important that this thing is big uh, so that the, the vacuum you have uh, something like this. You have P squared here, you have P squared squared here and so on. And you want to be living here and not slide down the hill to another vacuum where the operate, uh, spectrum of operators is completely different. Uh, but this object uh, doesn't look very scary to, I guess, some people because uh, you can introduce just a zeta function for large class of operators, which is a thing like this. So again, if you, if you know eigenvalues, that would be just sum of eigenvalues, uh, those that are not, not zero, to, uh, to power S. And now it's not that slippery because uh, there are rigorous mathematical theorems regarding zeta functions of various operators. So say for second order operator in four dimensions, you can prove that it's converges for S greater than two, apart from uh, the poles here and there, it's nice function and more of it's uh, analytic around zero so that this thing is just zeta of h of zero. So now it's not scary anymore because, well, uh, people use zeta function all the time and know how to compute it, in particular using heat kernel techniques. But uh, Segal used this definition and let me, let me give a brief idea of why, why it works. So first of all, If you have any, any function of just uh, commuting variable f, you can associate with the star uh, product function of, of say h. If it's analytic, so you just basically replace x to the k with uh, h star 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 h, hoping that it converges in some way. So uh, if your function is, is not analytic, you can use one or another transform like Fourier transform to expand it in terms of analytic. And then still you can make sense uh, out of it. For example, people play a lot with delta, with star, uh, star product delta functions and things like that. So uh, then for every function of this type, you can do quasi classical expansion. So you, you just expand in the, in the powers of this formal uh, Planck constant. And then uh, you have terms of order H uh, which looks something like this with double prime and then there's some h and remember this dx dp minus dp dx squared h plus dot 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 high order terms and so on. So this you can work out. And in fact, uh, in this in this language, uh, powers of h will just count the number of derivatives. So I will find while gravity at order h to the fourth. Uh, it, will, it, it will just count uh, the number of derivatives. Okay, now, uh, well, the first term somehow turns out to be irrelevant. So what you actually face are derivatives and derivatives of theta gives you delta function. So uh, trace is just the integral over dx dp as usual in this operatorial language. So what you find are objects like delta and then what Segal did, he introduced some uh, regulator, well, uh, that he called Dilaton, but it doesn't matter. And then what you find here are these guys, H, 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 and many DX, DP acting on, on them. These integrals you can do because uh, using this as a regulator and if you're in Euclidean signature, they nicely localize on sphere. 
And uh, then what it basically does, if you do integral over dp, it averages over p. That's, well, you can even put general metric here, mu, 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 mu. Uh, well, so averaging over p replaces effectively dp with metric that contracts derivatives. So eventually you get uh, some expansion in the number of x derivatives. And maybe <clears throat> some comments on, uh, on the literature because say we all know there are these non-commutative field theories where you don't have this, you just have x, x are non-commutative and hence you break Lorentz invariance. Uh, so here you don't break Lorentz invariance, but there are also proposals in the literature where you have similar type of objects, but there is nothing like this. And then you have problems actually uh, integrating over DP, so um, people treat it formally. And maybe uh, another similar thing is um, in what Harald actually does with uh, his proposal, but uh, in his proposal, he has certain vibration over space so that he also averages over, well, spins and derivatives in a sense, getting Lorentz invariant expressions. And uh, well, this is one way of how you can get something that makes sense just after integrating over dp and gives you some expansion and derivatives of your fields. And then one can also show, well, actually we already did here, but one can expand this a little bit more and prove that indeed they actually get this invariant under uh, uh, all these symmetries. And it starts from wild gravity. So what Segal did, as I already said, he worked out all quadratic terms on Minkowski space and also some cubic. And what you have, just well, to have to get, to get an idea. So you have some, well, some integral, and here you have fields of different spins with uh, how many derivatives? Four plus sum over S minus I minus two, I from one to N. So in particular, let's check uh, bilinear term. Bilinear terms are diagonal. So you have four plus two S minus four, two S derivatives, as I said. So uh, what's interesting here is that having graviton cost you no derivatives, which is nice because you expect actually graviton to enter non-polynomially so that you can assemble all these things into covariant derivatives, powers of Riemann tensors and so on and so forth. But this is the general structure of the theory that you can efficiently work out perturbatively say uh, around flat space. That's one definition that works. Now there's another definition that is due to Zetlin. Uh, well, let's start from the, the action where we introduced all these sources. And well, formally, you know what's that? Well, okay, let's put minus, uh, well, put minus here. Uh, well, it's some effective action. And of course, formally it's given by log that of H. And H is this P square plus all higher spins. Okay, so if, uh, well, remember that uh, these guys, uh, well, in, in terms of expansion of this full function H, I call them small H, but whenever there are, they were just infinitesimal sources, I call them A. So they were sources for higher spin current. So in principle, in some way, this W is a sum of correlators of all these higher spin currents. And now I'm not even writing the indices because I would be too long. Uh, well, because theory is a free one, it's very easy to compute what, correlate, what correlation functions of these guys is. So each of them is bilinear. So you write one loop diagram like this. Uh, this is one over box propagator. Uh, these are your J's. So you do weak contractions, very easy. This works when points are, are separated. So when they are not separated, you have problems. You can see in momentum space, you have certain divergences, which, well, which is an indication that 
this object is a bit formal. But people know how to compute it. And uh, mm, well, let, let, maybe let's go straight to the formula. So there will be some power like divergences. Don't care about them. There will be log divergent term and there will be some finite terms. So this is exactly the, the part I care about. And the definition by Zetin is that you, well, you have to compute this effective action, zoom in on the log divergent term. And as everyone knows, what, what stays in front of the log is invariant on its own. So this is, this is the action that is immediately invariant under all the symmetries. And this gives you another just feel theoretical efficient computational tool. And uh, if you want to have more details on how to do these computations, you can uh, compute heap kernel. And I recommend paper by uh, uh, Becker, uh, Jung, and Murat, who worked out all the details. Mm, probably, yeah. Um, okay, so. Yes, I, I, I'm insist together with you. And maybe the last thing I would say here is that was there is efficient uh, heat kernel technique to do this type of computations and uh, well, we define heat kernel as this type of an object. But what's important is that if you take trace of uh, this heat kernel, then again, as everyone knows, it admits a small uh, time expansion of the following of the following type. So if say I'm in four dimensions, it's t squared, then there are uh, what people call silly with uh, coefficients here, which come in the form of um, integrals of uh, certain objects, which are local functionals of whatever you have in this age. Sorry, Usually can I ask a question? Time. Sorry, what? can I ask a question? Yes. Question, the heat kernel, yes. works for, heat kernel works for second order operator. Your operator is high, high derivative operator. Yes. So that's why so that's why actually I'm not uh, I'm not expanding this strictly speaking uh, as it is. I expanding over uh, big gravitational background treating all these uh, higher spins as small. So again, there are many technical details, and I recommend paper by Becker, Jung, Murat, who went through this procedure. So what did what uh, what did they compute in that paper? What what actually did they compute, except for formal aspect? Uh, well, they, they carefully computed uh, heat kernel expansion, and uh, as a result, uh, they got uh, fratkin in action for higher spin fields. And uh, I think it didn't look at the interactions like cubic and so on, but it was clear that there is a formula for them. And later, also, there was a paper by Roberto Bonetti, who used a slightly different approach, but equivalent. Uh, uh, and he has more or less explicit formula for any order in interactions that you can imagine. For any so order in interaction? Oh, that, that's hmm? strong. Any order in interaction, that's strong. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's not that, well, <laughs> it means what, what you think the answer is and if it's beautiful or not. Computationally, yes, to, to any order, you can work it out. There are no any divergences or subtleties you need to know about the formulas they have. But of course, I mean, the quartic order it must be very ugly. So we need maybe some other variables and further insight to make it look more beautiful. But otherwise, just purely computationally, no problem. Um, yes, okay, so there is this um, uh, short time expansion. Uh, with silly David coefficients. And again, as uh, probably most people know, the, the lowest coefficients, they generate power divergences, and there's one 
coefficient here called A2, which is responsible for log divergences here. So if you want yet another definition that is, of course, equivalent uh, to all of this, uh, this A2, oops, or in general dimension, it would be A d over 2 coefficient is, uh, is the definition of conformal higher spin gravity action. And again, dropping uh, higher spins, we all know what it is. It's closely related to conformal anomaly. And uh, you know that this thing uh, consists of the um, C uh, coefficient of anomaly. And uh, there is also earlier invariant here. And of course, depending on the literature, people drop one thing or another because A coefficient is important uh, due to A theorem and things like that, but uh, it's topological, so we drop it. Uh, so what's important for us is this coefficient, which is again, uh, action of uh, uh, wild gravity. And uh, yeah, that's, that's yet another definition. So it's closely related to conformal and only. And this is what I said last time that I have two dirty tricks. Uh, the one is background fields and effective action, and another one are anomalies. So uh, conformal higher spin gravity is, is this coefficient, which is conformal anomaly somewhere. And well, depending on which matter you choose, where you start from, uh, we'll, you will get different terms, different spectrum, and so on. Yes, yes, what, 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 actually, what actually would be nice uh, to improve on given all these mathematical results on zeta function and heat kernel is to make uh, this type of objects well-defined whenever H is arbitrary or the differential operator. But perturbatively, if you're just interested in some vertices, uh, no problem here because uh, what's important is that while invariance fixes the number of derivatives. So if you interested in uh, 10 spins, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, you know how many, many derivatives are there. So there are no non-localities, things like that, that um, are usually present in higher spins. Uh, okay, so that's the definition. And uh, yeah, there are several papers where people work out details. And maybe one very last argument that is related to this one that I will use for ADS-CFT later. So suppose you actually, well, computed just two point function of these guys. So higher spin currents, as one can easily see, have this uh, conformal dimension in D dimensions. So then what, what you expect to get here is X squared D plus S minus two, and let's stay in D4. So then what you have here is, uh, I'm ignoring tensorial structure, but okay, you, you can work it out. So it's four uh, plus S. Well, uh, so you can actually represent it as, sorry, two S, S two S derivatives of one X to the four. And this is pretty bad, uh, just, well, distribution. So you need to regularize it. And uh, from the way it scales one over X to the four, you can kind of smell that it has the singular part uh, that is proportional to delta function e4 of x. So again, you get uh, exactly the same thing. So if you careful uh, at this level with uh, how you regularize all these expressions, you can arrive at the same order 2s uh, operator. So you see there is a local part in this correlation function, otherwise it's non-local. There is a local part that once you contract the sources with, you again run into fratkin seitlin operator. Well, work, works nicely in flat space. Of course, yeah, extending it to high orders and more general background may be difficult. Now, what are interesting and yet unsolved problems with this? First of all, are general gravitational backgrounds and extension of this fratkin seitlin operators, or maybe approaching from mathematical side, higher spin GMS operators to general backgrounds, understanding their properties and so on. Then of course, from the field theory point of view, uh, would be nice to investigate quantum properties of these theories and certain things been done by Zeitlin and collaborators. In particular, you can show that conformal anomaly for Formal higher spin gravity vanishes upon certain regularization. So as a, as a 
quantum field theory, it has good chances to be consistent at the quantum level. Then uh, thinking about going back to Kirill's talk yesterday, there is a very nice two papers by Mark uh, Laughlin, Adamo, and uh, Enel, who found self-dual truncation of this thing. So the theory is complicated. You can see it from, from the blackboard and the missing details. Uh, but if you if you go to twister space, uh, there is a very simple self-dual truncation of that one that, that, that they did. And what we fundamentally don't understand here is probably how the Cartan type uh, geometry for this thing would look like, because I exclusively worked with the metric tensor and its higher spin generalizations. But of course, like for metric tensor, we can introduce Cartan connection and uh, things like that. That was a topic of previous lectures. It would be nice to do something here, but well, at the free level that was done in Fratkin Linetsky, for example, but fully nonlinear understanding of what uh, conformal higher spin geometry means at the level of this uh, Cartan connection is unclear. Now, just uh, one comment about three dimensions, because in three dimensions, we know there are no conformal anomalies. So how one can get any action? So first of all, three dimensions are very special because uh, conformal higher spin fields as well as massless and partially massless, they don't have propagating degrees of freedom. So in the, in, these theories are much simpler and this is one of the few cases where say this neuter procedure can be completed and you can really prove that these are all theories or all theories with these particular fields look like that. So the, uh, the final result is that while we still don't understand perhaps what uh, Cartan type conformal higher spin geometry is in three dimensions, there are simple actions, which are all of uh, Chern Simon's type. So what, what one can do is uh, to take any Lie algebra that contains uh, conformal algebra, well, this one or that one, depending on which signature you like. You take a connection of this uh, Lie algebra and you write Chern Simon's action. That works because uh, we already know from many years ago that gravity, pure gravity, uh, is equivalent uh, to Chern Simon's action. And conformal gravity, as was shown by Horn and Witten, is equivalent to Chern Simon's action for, for, for this algebra. So, likewise, if you take any algebra that, that contains these ones, and whose decomposition gives you some nice representations that we will talk about in right turn Simon section, you get fully nonlinear theory uh, that- Really, sorry, there was early work by Neuenhausen on n equals one supergravity, conformal yes, supergravity. True. True, true. And yes. conformal gravity is part of supergravity. Yes, yes, somehow, somehow conformal supergravity and supergravity people did many things which relate <laughs> to specialized to bosonic situation, uh, but somehow, yes, references. So supergravity is not good enough for you. Hmm? Supergravity is not good enough for you. Oh, I, I mean, you didn't mention supergravity. Conformal supergravity was just done earlier than conformal gravity. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. It was earlier, supergravity is somehow earlier in these things, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so everything, so one can, uh, so one can actually prove uh, that uh, all theories with uh, say massless, partially massless or conformal higher spin fields in three dimensions have to be of that form. So there, there has to be some Chern Simons uh, action for some uh, Lie algebra. And of course, in, in the massless case, for the you know, half of the audience that actually worked on this. Uh, so now the point uh, I would like to make is uh, relation to anomalies. So in three dimensions, there is no conformal anomaly, but there is a parity anomaly. So one can try to do uh, the same thing, but now you need fermion because this is exactly the, the system that has this anomaly. So uh, it's known that, well, say if you, if you couple this guy to, to uh, spin one, gauge field, then uh, 
uh, there is uh, there is parity anomaly in three dimensions, which means that there is some imaginary part of this action, and this imaginary part, well, up to some coefficients which I'm not writing, is exactly churn Simons. So now, uh, if you, if you remember, uh, well, uh, the way we generalized to higher spins was to just introduce all these higher spin currents and couple them to higher spin fields. So likewise, you can imagine that in doing that. There is, uh, there is parity anomaly that gives you, in fact, in some terms, uh, churn simons action uh, formulation. And, and that, that's, that's the thing that relates a little bit this Cartan type formulation to the Segal and uh, metric like formulation. But the beauty of this uh, thing is that uh, you have plenty of finite dimensional algebras, uh, while this will give you some infinite dimensional spectrum. And uh, yeah, so th this is what I wanted to say that there is in three dimensions, sometimes there is relation to anomaly, which is parity anomaly. And let us jump to edges CFT. Well, uh, I think, well, I mean, if you look at how this anomaly is computed, uh, it's obvious that it's the case. But uh, there is paper, for example, by Bonora and collaborators from five, six years ago who actually worked it out well at the free level. So then, then you can see that equations that you get out of this action upon eliminating all of these auxiliary fields are exactly, well, this cotton, uh, higher spin cotton tensor generalization in three dimensions. So you can get these uh, from parity anomaly. Then, yes, again, like, like in this example, it would be actually great uh, to find some uh, rigorous uh, theorems uh, for operators of that type. And here would be nice to do something like this about parity anomaly. And so in this, in this case, parity anomaly is related to what people call eta function of differential operator, not zeta, but I'm not going into all these details. And if you wish, in two dimensions, the same action phi h phi is a generalization of um, Nambu, Gotu, Polikov, et cetera. But I'm not going into that side remark, but so that you can do something in two dimensions as well. Okay, now really the shortest exposition of eddy safety correspondence. <laughs> because uh, obviously I can't do this and combine with any other non-trivial material. So uh, either you know what it is or you don't. Uh, so then for, if you know, probably the formulas I'm writing are useless, but if you don't know, well, they're useless again. So, uh, so the statement is that you, you would like to have uh, conformal field theory in uh, D dimensions. There's some operators there, couple them, well, I, I use the same letter as before. Uh, couple them to some sources, compute this thing, and compare it with a, a path integral of capital Phi of some quantum gravity action in antideceder space of one dimension higher, where important is that there is some boundary condition of the, on the fields that they approach this asymptotic as z goes to zero, and uh, z is uh, one of the Poincare coordinates in which metric looks like this. So ideally, you have two sides of this thing well defined, compute, compare, enjoy. Uh, so in, in our case, of course, these are. Uh, higher spin currents that are coupled to exactly the sources we had before. So these guys, well, phi, then are known as Bronsdell fields. So I'm using capital indices for anti D plus one dimensional indices. So these are Bronsdell fields, for example. One can choose different maybe uh, field descriptions. And now we want to compare. So then, then you need an action here. And uh, well, here you have a small problem that it's not known. Moreover, it's known that starting from some order, it becomes too non-local for 
uh, usual field uh, theory tools to make sense. That's why uh, I think I said bits of holography because there are certain things that you can rigorously do here, but they mostly confined to uh, free field level because uh, you don't know what's going on here in general. Uh, yeah. So, and in principle, there are two types of computations that, that you can do. One is the usual field theory type, which is painful, and another one is uh, Pfefferman gram expansion, which is less painful, and I'll illustrate. Uh, well, but before I need to raise something. So the usual type of computation is that you write basically Feynman diagrams, which are called Witten diagrams, and propagators there are, are just propagators, but in anti sitter space, compute these diagrams and get correlation functions. In doing so, there are some, some issues related to the fact that this bulk action diverges near the boundary, uh, because the boundary is not the boundary, it's conformal boundary, and uh, one needs to carefully eliminate these divergences. So, as a, as a result, as a result from anti sitter space, say at the level of two point functions, one get expression of type, let me write it like this. We have the sources, a x, a y, and I'm ignoring indices. Plus epsilon squared delta, where epsilon is a regulator that I keep. So your CFT lives here. This is your interior of anti sitter space. And in order to have well-defined expressions, you step epsilon <clears throat> meters from the boundary and uh, do certain subtractions here. So at the end of the day, say at the level of two-point functions, you arrived at something like this, where for a uh, good enough delta, you can further set epsilon to zero because all, all, all the worst things are already gone. But I kept this epsilon just because um, it is similar to, to this observation here, that if you have correlation functions and the weights are such that your distribution is not well defined, then you can find some log divergent piece. And ADS uh, computation equips you naturally with a regulator, which is distance from the boundary. And uh, you get already regulated two point function from which you can extract the local part. And it will be, well, well once these guys are Fratkin um, Satian fields, which are boundary values of frontal fields, what you get is exactly the Fratkin Satian action. And this was done for all spins explicitly and carefully with all coefficients by Mitsaev some years ago. But uh, the first argument along these lines goes back to. Uh, Zaitlin and Liu, who were the, maybe perhaps the first to say that, unlike in the first papers in IDSFT correspondence, where this was just generating uh, functional correlation functions, and A were treated as inf infinitesimal sources, they said that maybe you should actually introduce carefully them as background fields. And they, what uh, they considered was, of course, the case of an equal four superior mills, for which the natural sources are a multiple of conformal uh, supergravity. And well, here you have gauge supergravity action on, on IDS5. But the argument was that maybe you should uh, do things a bit, well, generalize them a little bit so that they make sense on general background. Moreover, you should uh, look not only at the point split correlation functions, but you should also be careful about local terms and match those. And what they've done, they they reproduced uh, the kinetic term of uh, conformal supergravity from uh, ADS gravity computation. But the argument is, is, is roughly this, that once you carefully compute two-point function, what you get, well, there is a regulator here. So 
if you're careful about all this distribution, there is some local part. That's a field theory way. There is less painful way, which is Pfefferman gram. Because um, it looks like there are lots of uh, things under the rug, all these regularizations, subtractions, and so on, which I don't show to you. Uh, but uh, there is a maybe cleaner way to get exactly the same result, but at the level of equations of motion. So the, what this gives you for spin two is conformal gravity action. For higher spins, you get this uh, fratkin zetlin actions. Uh, but if we're interested not in actions, but in equations of motion, then you can get them uh, quicker. Uh, so let me just recall uh, the original Pfefferman gram argument where just because of um, historical uh, burden, I'm choosing another type of coordinates. Okay, so then you expand uh, your solution to Einstein equations in anti sitter space uh, near the boundary, and as a result, you get well, the first term, which is exactly the metric uh, to be associated with the metric on the boundary. Uh, then there is second term, well, let me call it G1, G menu, which by virtue of Einstein equations is expressed in terms of this one as a, well, a scout and tensor. So what's important is that it's kind of nabla squared, well, nabla way, way to put it. So it's second order derivative in, uh, in, the, in the boundary metric. So uh, then you have further terms with uh, J2, menu plus, et cetera. And uh, importantly, and this is what physicists do all the time, you have term with log. Uh, so you can determine uh, this thing entirely, only its trace, and it in fact represents the second uh, boundary data that you can have for a second order differential equation. That's the first, that's the second. What's important is that if you allow yourself to introduce these logarithmic terms, then by virtue of Einstein equations, this thing uh, is expressed as a Bach tensor. And this is what implicitly uh, people do here because they just look for bulk to boundary propagators. Uh, it's, it's not, well, you may not be careful what analytic structure of that is. And once you come back to the two point function, this is where you find that there was some log somewhere, uh, which gives you this local part. Or maybe mathematical way to approach that is that we forbid logs. We want just uh, this regular expansion. And then this thing represents an abstraction. So I, I can't actually solve my Einstein equations beyond this order in the abstraction is the Bach tensor, which is a well, equation of motion of uh, informal gravity. So now what, what people did and was uh, uh, well, Becker, Grigoriev, basically. So uh, you can run the same type of argument for higher spin fields, but now you lose a bit of uh, information because this argument is fully nonlinear. So this is Scout and this is Bach, everything is fully nonlinear. So for higher spins, you can do something linear and then you won't be surprised to know that, say if you take all the field of spin S, yeah, then uh, the the boundary value, which is analogous to this thing, is exactly the source that I introduced. And you continue this expansion. And somewhere here, you find log. And by virtue of Fronsdal equations of motion, the coefficient of this log, if you let it be here, uh, becomes uh, equations uh, of, from fratkin zetlin action. But if you forbid the log, okay, you, you consider fratkin zetlin to be an abstraction to, to solve in this equation. So I think this, uh, well, first of all, this is a shorter way, it's, it's more rigorous, you don't have to do any integrals and so on, you just do a symptotic expansion. But this is another way uh, to arrive at uh, fratkin zetlin operators. And of course, what would be nice to do is to extend it to general backgrounds, nonlinear level and so on. So uh, that's why I said bits of holography because 
the full story is not yet understood. So what's understood is that uh, there are these conformal higher spin gravities, which, uh, oh, sorry, okay. Uh, a couple of questions, so I conclude, uh, conclude, conclude with some open problems. So there are as many of conformal higher spin geometries as matter and conformal invariant equations you can imagine. For each of them, uh, there, is, there are several equivalent ways to construct actions. So uh, then uh, once you have these actions, there are many interesting questions that you can ask for. Because once you have this S of H uh, for whatever field content, uh, you can consider linearization of this action on various backgrounds. For example, you can try to turn off all higher spin fields. Well, take something that is solution of file gravity, Bach flat, linearize all of this and look at the uh, higher spin GGMS type operators that emerged out of this theory because uh, this construction is not existence of inverse function. It's, it's, it's constructive construction, so you can work it out. So uh, then, mm, well, just maybe is a little bit. Uh, so there is a problem of conformal invariance, which is not solved in the sense that uh, ignoring all these topological things in four dimensions, there is one, in six dimensions, there are three, a wild tensor uh, type things. In eight dimension, Nicolas can tell us, well, uh, and well, in general, you don't know. Okay, so here is a way to construct uh, all of them, hopefully. So you take any matter you like, any conformal uh, invariant equation, work out uh, theory of background fields or conformal higher spin geometry. Uh, that, that's a canonical construction. Then you take uh, zeta function of zero, which is this action. You chop off higher spin fields because you're not interested in them. What you end up with, of course, is a conformally invariant uh, expression in, in metric. So that, that, this is a constructive way Let's say to approach uh, conformal invariance, if you wish. But there are many questions that you can immediately start asking and answering once uh, once you have uh, conformal higher spin gravity, even if you are not interested in higher spins themselves, because as I tried to argue last time, if you pick specific background for higher spin fields, like you pick phi, which is g, 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 contracted with p, then it would lead to some uh, GGMS type operators and so on. But from field theory side, these theories are interesting because they're well defined. There is always finite number of derivative everywhere and they have good chances to be consistent as quantum field theories. So thank you very much, I stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, are, we are already late. Sorry. So I have one small question on your Pfeffman gram expansion. Yes. So um, why don't you have terms like square root of rho in that expansion if you uh, want to apply this to in, things in, like in which one? gravity? In, in, in this one or? No, I mean, when you expand this is the metric. Uh, yes. Yes. So, so I mean, in Einstein gravity, I agree that this would be the standard Pfeffman gram expansion. Yes. But uh, in, in theories like conformal gravity, you would have uh, Terms that are subleading but not as subleading as as rho. Ah, okay. Yes, so, sorry, but I mean the the action I'm taking in anti de Sitter space is the action of usual gravity or usual massless higher spin fields, and then I do Pfefferman gram for them to to recover conformal higher spin fields or well, uh, while gravity in one dimension lower. So I'm not I'm not doing actually Pfefferman gram expansion of while gravity. Okay, I see. Uh, so th this Thanks. is like five dimensional thing. And what you get here are four dimensional operators. All right. Questions? Thanks. Um, so, in the first part of your talk, you obtained your Carol Harris higher spin action from, so you focused on some background of this general model and, and then at some terms in the Zilli de Witt and, and so on and so forth. Yes. So, but in the end of the day, if you put back everything, it still just comes from this original model, which boils down just to some signs of eigenvalues. So doesn't that suggest that this higher spin theory is in some sense almost trivial or integrable or whatever? I mean. Um, 
Well, I, I would say that eventually it should be simple, but you're right that there are some ways to understand it as a trivial one. For example, you can uh, try to count the number of degrees of freedom in some way. Of course, it's infinite, you have to re regularize it. Then we can show that this uh, effective number of degrees of freedom wants to be zero. So in a sense that there are as many gauge symmetries as fields, because I mean, both are infinite, but in the right regularization, they want to vanish. Then also, uh, well, Zaitlin, Jung, Nakach, and then Zaitlin, Kari, probably. I mean, they uh, they did some computations trying well trying to compute scattering processes in this theory, coupled to the original matter phi, and then they found that uh, in fact the scattering amplitude vanishes. So as a distribution, it's not, but when you uh, set Mandelstam values to their physical values, it actually vanishes. And there are some higher spin symmetry arguments that would justify that. So. Yes, eventually I would say, uh, say uh, if you are around flat space and computing scattering processes, probably in the right regularization, they should, they should all vanish. But say at the quantum level, uh, that would be highly non-trivial thing to show. But uh, ignoring field theory aspects, if you say, <laughs> if you on, on, on general gravitational background, you can use this theory as a, as a, as a device to generate lots of conformally invariant in co well, covariant quantities uh, out of nothing and, and it's constructive. But I would, would agree with you that as a field theory, probably eventually it's kind of trivial, integrable. Yeah.